And everybody said, Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the workers. Thank you for our faithfulness and the commitment of your people. We're asking, Lord, that tonight you speak to every heart in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, the grace to do, the grace to observe, and the grace to walk and act the way you are training us and teaching us to act. Your grant to everyone in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, the proper understanding of your word you give to everyone. And we also, in turn, will go to your house fellowship and go to all the members on our leadership and give them your truth without any alteration, without misinterpretation, in Jesus' name. The same grace you give us, we pray you pass on to the people who are listening to us so that by your grace they will live the life they ought to live as we also live the life we ought to live in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody said, God bless you. You can see that today we come to our workers' uh, meeting. And this is the time that we need to give ourselves more and more to the work of the Lord so that this work as God himself has planned will prosper in every hand in Jesus' name. We're looking today at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. In this chapter, uh, written by Paul the Apostle, he was talking to the believers and he was uh, asking that the believers will pray for him and they'll pray for him so that the word of God will have free course and the word of God will prosper in the lives of the people he's speaking to just like the word of God had prospered also in their own lives. And so he said they should pray that all the places he was going whether it was evangelizing or edifying the church or building the church or establishing the church that the word of God the word of God will have free course that means freely without any hindrance and without any barrier the word of God will penetrate the hearts of the people who are listening to him and the same thing we ought to pray today we have many programs and we have uh, many uh, ministry areas of ministries going on either in the crusade or at the Bible study or at the Sunday service or any of the meetings we have that the the word of God will not have any barrier. The word of God will not have any hindrance, but the word of God will penetrate the hearts and the lives of the people who are listening to the word of God. That when sinners listen, the sinners will be convicted of their sins, and the sinners will genuinely, honestly go to the Lord in prayer, and the word of God will drive them to real conversion definite conversion, a kind of conversion that is measurable, a kind of conversion that is visible, a kind of conversion that people will see and they will know truly the word of God has had free course in the hearts and the lives of the people and that uh, the ministers who are preaching that word of God, they'll be strong in the faith and strong in the Lord and courageous to keep on preaching the word of God as they have received so they will also give uh, that word. And then he spoke to the people or writing to the people that the word of God will have real power definite power in the hearts and lives of the people who are listening. And they do this in view of the Lord's return. They were waiting for the coming of the Lord, for the return of the Lord, and that all the prayer, all the ministry, and everything that they do will be according to their waiting and their expectation of the coming of the Lord. The topic we're dealing with today, faithfully praying fervently in view of Christ's coming. Praying 
not only praying, but fervently praying. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And because of that, we need to make sure that whenever we pray with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, we, we pray fervently and we pray faithfully. That means according to the word of the Lord, according to the, um, to the revelation of the Lord, we're praying to the Father and we're praying to the Lord Jesus Christ and we're praying according to the will of God and we're praying Pray with importunity, faithfully praying fervently in view of Christ's coming. It's coming again. And because it's coming again, we need to pray so that believers will be ready and so that backsiders will be restored and so that sinners will be saved. It is the will of God that sinners be saved. It is the will of God that saints be edified. It is the will of God that the church be established. And so we are praying so that the power of God will penetrate the hearts and the lives of the people who are hearing the word of God and they will be prepared for the will of God for the coming of the Lord. And as we look at uh, the message today, faithfully praying, fervently praying in view of Christ's coming. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the privilege of praying for the for gospel penetration. We want the gospel to penetrate into the hearts of people. And it's a privilege for the believer, for the child of God, that will so pray that the gospel will penetrate the hearts of the people will touch their hearts, will transform their hearts, will lift up their hearts and make them live the way they ought to live. Number two is the power of the prayers of godly people. The power of the prayers of godly people. And as we pray, we believe that God answers prayer. And as God answers the prayer, the power in the gospel, the power in the word will still touch the hearts of the people and turn the hearts of the people, transform the hearts of the people that they will completely give themselves to the grace of God and to the godliness of the word of God. Number three is our preparation with patience. That word patience there means perseverance. It means endurance. It means that we're praying, we're preparing for the coming of the Lord. We're preparing when He will appear in the clouds and appear in His glorious preeminence. It is our preparation then as we're looking for the coming of the Lord, as we're waiting for the coming of the Lord and we're persevering and we're enduring and we're going through, bearing our cross and doing everything He wants us to do so that when He will come, you will not be found wanting, I will not be found wanting in Jesus' name. Our preparation with patience for His glorious preeminence. Remember the topic again is praying faithfully and praying fervently in view of Christ's return. Christ coming. Let's look at number one. Number one is the privilege of praying for gospel penetration. Praying for gospel penetration. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, looking at verse 1, it says, Finally, brethren, he had been writing to them. Now he said, Finally. It said at the last note, at the last paragraph, it says the last thing I have for you, after you had written from 1 Thessalonians chapters 1 to 5, 2 Thessalonians chapters 1 and 2, it says now finally, brethren, pay for us that the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as, as it is with you. And then he says in verse 2, in verse 2 he tells us about what they need to do, about the way they need to commit themselves to this kind of prayer. And he says that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. He had said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, he had said, there's a great door open that opens 
open a great door of evangelization a great door of penetration of the gospel a great door of spreading the gospel everywhere he said but there are many adversaries now he says we want you to pray for us us apostles us prophets us evangelists us pastors and teachers so that the word of god will have free cause that we we the ministers and we the leaders may be delivered from unreasonable men and wicked men for all men have not faith there are three things we're looking at here number one is the purpose of praying for evangel evangelizing ministers that is the ministers who evangelize the ministers who go around evangelizing and preaching the gospel to every creature so that they will be brought to repentance and brought to uh, salvation those are the evangelizing ministers the purpose of praying for them Number two, the penetration and prevalence of the evangelistic message. The message that saves, the message that convicts, the message that drives sinners on their knees so that they can pray for the conversion, for the salvation of their souls. The penetration and the prevalence of such message, evangelistic message. Number three, the prospect of persevering de despite evil men already you said there are evil men there are unbelieving men there are antagonistic men there are persecuting men and he says he wanted to continue preaching the gospel and we need to continue preaching the gospel and we have the prospect of persevering of enduring of going on and moving on and preaching the gospel in spite of or despite the evil men. Let's look at number one. Number one is the purpose of praying for evangelizing ministers. Look at the first part of Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, finally, brethren, pray for us. Finally, brethren, pray for us. What's the purpose? That the word of the Lord may have free cause that the word of the Lord may be glorified in the people we're preaching to, just as it had been with you. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, the harvest is much, and the laborers are few, the harvesters are few, the soul winners are few, the evangelists are few, and he wants us to pray that the Lord will send harvesters, will send soul winners, will send evangelists, will send people with the evangelistic message, send them to the field. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 37. It says, then said he, then said Jesus unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. And as we look at our communities, the harvest truly is plenteous. As we look at the rich people in your community, your local government, in your state, in your region, in your country, you will know that the harvest truly is plenteous. As we look at the number of people who have not been born again, and people who go to church and they have never heard the word of the gospel, you will know the harvest truly is plenteous. As you look at church goers, religious people, traditional people who have heard the word of God over and over, but they have not really heard a meaningful salvation message. And they're still there groping in their sins and groping in their evil. You will know the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The laborers are few. The preachers are few. The teachers are few. And the evangelists and the reapers of the harvest, they're few. And so he says in verse 38, in verse 38 he says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send that God himself, that the Lord of the harvest, the one whose mind is centered and focused on the harvest, and the number one thing on the heart of the Almighty God is the harvesting of souls. Is the preaching of the gospel. Is in going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. He is the Lord of the harvest. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. 
purposeful praying, persevering praying, importunate praying that God himself will send laborers into the harvest field. And then in, in Ephesians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 19. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're looking at a verse 19. It is Paul the Apostle again that is saying that the brethren should pray. They should pray for saints in general. That's in verse 18. And now in verse 18, and for me, pray for me. Paul the Apostle said, pray for me. He has gone and those of us who are leaders and we're doing the work that God gave him to do and we're going about and preaching the gospel and penetrating um, communities and penetrating hearts and calling sinners to be reconciled unto God and we're pleading with sinners, be you reconciled unto God. We're also asking pray for us, pray for me that utterance may be given unto me. Pray for me that my mouth will not be muscled. Pray for me that fear or discouragement or whatever it is will not clamp down on me, will not stop me, will not hinder me, will not push me back. Pray. It is the prayer of the saints of God. Joined with the preaching of the servants of God that will come together and bring a powerful penetration and conviction in the hearts and the lives of the people. And so we shouldn't think that, you know, the preachers, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers, they are all in all. They have grace, they have Christian experience, they have the power, they have the vision, they have the courage, they have the boldness, they have everything it takes to be able to preach the gospel he says no he says we're all they had got that's the Paul that had gone to the thought heavens and had heard things that no human being had heard before him even unspeakable things of the greatness and the glory of God all the same he said pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. It says that the reason I'm asking for prayer, it wasn't asking for prayer for any personal thing or any personal need, but just that most sinners will be saved. Just that it will go to many places and cover many regions, and the word of God will penetrate the hearts of the people he was praying to. And then he said in verse 20, in verse 20, he tells us, he says, He is in persecution, he is uh, in the in imprisonment, but all the same, he said, that will not stop him for which I am an ambassador in bonds that they are in I mistake. Speak boldly as I ought to speak, as I ought to speak. He said, when you are called into the ministry, when you are called into preaching the gospel, there's a way you ought to speak. You should not speak timidly. You should not speak um, in, in a fearful way. You should not speak in a, in a way that nobody is persuaded. He said, the prayer I'm asking for as a preacher of the gospel, as an apostle, and as a person the Lord has given the ministry, the mystery of the gospel to, is that I will open my mouth and I will declare that word boldly as I ought to speak. If that is what he requested for at that time, that's the same thing we're requesting for at this time. And as you pray for the ministers, your own pastor, as you pray for the ministers, our group pastors, as you pray for the ministers, our region pastors, our state pastors, and our GS, and all the ministers we're praying for, we're praying, we're praying, and we're praying fervently, and we're praying faithfully, and we're praying with opportunity, and we're praying with faith that God will help them will help us to open our mouths boldly and to declare the word of God as the word ought to be declared in Jesus' name. And that the word will have effect. Effect in saving souls. Effect in, effect in turning lives around. Effect in the transformation of lives and the transformation of families. Effect in making people who hear the word of God to stand and to stand firm for the word of the Lord. I pray the Lord will give us grace to pray more. I say grace to pray more. 
and grace to believe more and more will be the conversion of sinners and the commitment of saints in the church of the living God in Jesus in Romans chapter 15 we're looking at verse 30 Romans chapter 15 we're looking at verse 30 here Paul the apostle is still talking to the church the church in Ephesus the church at Rome and the church everywhere all the church he had connection with that those churches that they will pray for him and he tells us in chapter 15 verse 30 he says now I beseech you brethren for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake he said it's not for my sake it's for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ he died on the cross of Calvary but the sinners have not heard and if we not go if we do not go out in strength in power in conviction and courage if they do not hear how will they be saved so for the sake of Christ who died for the sinners he said for his sake you pray for us and for the love of the spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me in your prayers to God for me let's look at number two here number two we're talking now on the penetration and prevalence of the evangelistic message what's the evangelistic message that Jesus died for our sins he was buried and he rose again for our justification and that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved and that whosoever will believe that Christ died for him and that he rose again for his justification he believes in the heart he confesses with the mouth such a person shall be saved for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He says that word, that's the evangelistic message, and he's praying for the penetration and the prevalence of that evangelistic message. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians, we're looking at chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord, not the word of man, the the word of the Lord, not the tradition of man, the word of the Lord, not the law of Moses, the word of the Lord, the word of grace, the word of the gospel, and the word that reveals and projects Christ as the only Savior, that the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you. Look at Acts chapter 13. We're reading from verse 47. Acts chapter 13, reading from verse 47. And for so as the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And that's the reason Paul the Apostle went out. That's the reason we go out. That's the reason we, we promote Christ. That's the reason we persuade men that salvation is only in Christ. And we go is a light to the Gentiles. And we become light to the Gentiles that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. You understand then, we're not just to localize the gospel, we're not to confine the gospel, we're not to tie down the gospel in one place because the gospel, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel that prepares people for a new life, a good life here on earth and an heavenly life up beyond that gospel is for the ends of the earth. We might say for all the nations of the earth, for all the countries of the earth, and for all the communities of the earth, for everyone, every creature on earth. That's why Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel is for every creature on earth. And then in verse 48, 
38, in verse 48, it tells us, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Those who believed were for eternal life, and eternal life was for them. And in verse 49, verse 49 it tells us about the result of that when the gospel came to them, when the gospel of salvation came to them, when the gospel that brought conviction and conversion, when it penetrated their hearts, it says, and the word of the Lord was published throughout, throughout, throughout all the region. It tells us in First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. It tells us about uh, this uh, purpose of the gospel and this penetration of the gospel and this prevalence of the word of Christ, the word of salvation everywhere. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in to you that it was not in vain. You brethren, it is like you know that our entrance unto you and when we entered, we entered with the gospel. We came with the gospel. We presented the gospel. We preached the gospel. We publicized the gospel unto you and praised the Lord. It was not in vain. Why was it not in vain? What was their attitude? How did they receive that the word of God was not in vain? Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it tells us how they received the word, how they accepted the word, how they believed the word, how they embraced the word when the word of the Lord came unto them. For this cause also, thank we God, without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it. Look at this, look at this, not at the word of men, not at the word of men, not at the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. It was like when the apostles spoke to them, they were all ears, they were all eyes, they opened their mouths, they opened their hands to the word of God. It was like God standing before them, Christ standing before them. It was like God in person declaring the word unto them and they received Received the word. They had nothing to take away from the word, add to the word, dilute the word, mutilate the word, not at all. They received it exactly as it was given because they could not be wiser than God, they could not be greater than God. They received it as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. We're told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 reading from verse 11. Acts chapter 17 verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. They didn't even know what word was coming to them. It will bring conviction. It will bring correction. It will bring conversion. It will bring consecration. It will bring all the things that the benefits of Calvary to them. They didn't know what was coming, but even though they didn't know what was coming, they prayed and they committed themselves to the Lord and they received the word with all readiness of mind and then after they search the scriptures search the scriptures where that those things to see that those things were so because of that many people believe look at verse 12 it tells us there in verse 12 how they believed how they accepted the word of the lord and the word of the lord came to them and they received that with all readiness of mind therefore many of them believe Therefore, because they heard and they received with readiness of mind, and they also read the scriptures and saw the scriptures, and they looked at the scriptures comparing spiritual things with spiritual and committing themselves totally to the revelation of the word. It says, because of that, therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men, not a few. I pray that that same commitment the Lord will give to us today. 
And after we've heard the word of God, we go back home and we search again and read again and compare scripture with scripture and spend quality time reading the same word, reading those references, internalizing them and taking them in so that we will benefit from the word in an optimum sense, in a maximum sense, and the word of God will do good in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the prospect of persevering despite evil men. Despite evil men. It tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and there we're looking at verse 2. It says, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men unreasonable and wicked men paul the apostle said he knew they were there and he knew that they would try to hinder the progress of the gospel he didn't say because they are there i will not uh, go out today i will not preach the gospel today now the other time i think it was last tuesday we learned that uh, you know when christ saw all those pharisees and all their plot and all their controversies he withdrew himself but you know that was just an action of a particular day. He didn't withdraw totally and never come out again. He still came out the day persecuting Capernaum. He went to another place and preached the word. And so don't misinterpret and misapply the word of God. Jesus withdrew himself. Yes, yes, yes. But on a particular day, at a particular occasion, but then he went out and went forth and he went on preaching the gospel until the very last day when he said, Father, I have finished the work you have given me to do. You will finish in Jesus' name. But if you're always on the run, always in the hiding, how will you finish? I will finish. I will finish. That means if you have, you know, withdrawn for a day, for a week, or for a little time, come out because you will succeed in Jesus' name. And now you said, unreasonable men are there, and wicked men are there, for all men have not faith. Hold on. The men who do not have faith, those are the unreasonable men. The men, the people who do not have faith, those are the wicked men. When faith comes into our lives, faith transforms us. Faith changes us. That when faith comes, when no more unreasonable, you will no more be unreasonable. I will no more be unreasonable. But if those men are there, persecutors are there, despite the evil men despite the persecutors we launch out and we move on and we break forth and we give the gospel in jesus name in second thessalonians in second timothy chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 11 second timothy chapter 3 here we're looking at verse 11 it tells us in verse 11 it, it was talking to timothy and it was telling timothy reminding timothy what he had seen, what he had observed about him. He said, the persecutions and the afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all, out of them all, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Will he deliver you? Out of how many of your persecutions? Out of how many of your afflictions? Out of how many of your difficulties? Praise the Lord, you are delivered already. Look at verse 12 there in verse 12. It says in verse 12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ, whether in that generation or in this generation or in the generations to come, yea, and all that will live godly, whether in the locality of Paul at that time or your own locality at this time, anywhere you are, in any country you are, there's no point saying, I am moving from this country, I will 
run to that, uh, that country, anywhere we are, all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it tells us, it says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What's the conclusion? What do I do then? Evil men, wicked men, or reasonable men in every community, what am I to do as a preacher of the gospel? Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Continue. I will continue. Continue. Jesus says continue. I'm coming very soon by and by. We continue in preaching the gospel. We continue in praying for the ministers. We continue in our discipleship program. We continue in the follow-up. We continue in knocking on doors. We continue on teaching. And teaching the word of the gospel unto the people. But continue thou in all the things which thou hast learned and had been persuaded of knowing of whom thou was learned that we we'll come to point number two now point number two we're looking at the power of the prayer of godly people the power of the prayer of godly people and there are three things here number one the preservation of the godly from evil the preservation of the godly from evil number two the practice of godliness in um, every, in everything in everything in a, everything small everything great everything big everything moderate everything in your local family everything in your extended community everything in your profession everything everywhere the practice of godliness in everything number three here our prayers to God for everyone everywhere our prayers unto God everywhere for everyone and everywhere let's look at number one here number one is the preservation of the godly from evil second Thessalonians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 3 it says but the Lord is faithful our God is faithful your God is faithful your Savior, Redeemer, is faithful. The one who has called you and the one who has commissioned you and the one who has sent you forth everywhere, that God is faithful. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. You didn't hear that one. Let's make it personal. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish me and keep me from evil he'll preserve you from evil in jesus name look at john chapter 17 and i'm reading from verse 15 john chapter 17 and we're reading from verse 15 here it says i pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world here is jesus christ praying his priestly prayer here is Jesus praying for the, the priestly prayer for his own disciples, the peculiar people he has chosen out of the world. And he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. There will be persecution in the world. There will be attacks in the world. There will be afflictions in the world. There will be unprintable things, unspeakable things that will happen in the world. And yet Jesus said, I'm not praying that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And you know, the Father always answers the prayer of his only begotten Son. And his prayer for you God the Father will answer. In this generation, at all times, in all situations, Jesus Christ himself said, I pray that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. He will keep you. 
He'll protect you. He'll preserve you until the very time of the end in Jesus' name. And look at verse 16 there. In verse 16, it tells us, here is the prayer of Jesus continuing. And here is what Jesus Christ was saying. He said, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Then in verse 17, he says, sanctify them, purify them, make them holy through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Once we accept him, and once we receive him and we allow him to penetrate into every nook and corner of our hearts to sanctify us, to cleanse us, to make us holy, to make us pure, and to make us a godly, and to implant his godliness and righteousness into us. He sanctifies us by the truth. And then because he sanctifies us, that same prayer of his that he prayed to sanctify us is the same prayer that he prayed that the father will keep us from evil and assure as he sanctifies you assure he will keep you from evil and then in verse 18 in verse 18 he tells us as the father as thou hast sent me into the world even so have i also sent them into the world. We're looking at Psalm 121, reading from verse 7. Psalm 121, reading from verse 7. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil, and he shall preserve thy soul. Whatever will bring your soul into jeopardy, whatever will bring your soul into lostness whatever will bring your soul into the eternal hell imprisonment of the of eternity the lord will preserve you the lord will protect you he will not allow any evil to overtake you in this world in your ministry in jesus name the Lord, the God of heaven, the Lord shall preserve thee from uh, how many evils? Say it convincingly. Say it as if you know that belongs to you. He'll preserve you from all evil. Evil hidden behind a conspiracy, the Lord will preserve you. Hidden, uh, he evil that is. Uh, going rampant and flowing everywhere from that evil the Lord will preserve you the Lord shall preserve you from all evil he shall preserve thy soul look at verse 8 in verse 8 there he tells us he says the Lord shall preserve thy going out I need a bigger amen there and thy coming in from this time forth and even forever. You need to read that by yourself and let it sink in. One, two, three, go personal. The Lord shall preserve my going out and my coming in from this time forth and even forever. Amen. The Lord confirm it in your life. In Second, uh, Second Timothy chapter four, we're looking at verse seventeen. Second Timothy chapter four, reading from verse seventeen. Here he tells us, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known. The reason why God preserves us, the reason why God keeps us, and the reason why God protects us is so that the preaching of the gospel and the preaching of heaven's message might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. You'll be delivered from the mouth of the lion. And then in verse 18, in verse 18, it said, The Lord shall deliver me from, tell me, 
the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever amen. amen point number two now point number two the practice of godliness in everything it tells us in second thessalonians chapter three reading from verse four second thessalonians chapter three and we're reading here from verse 4. It says, and we have confidence. Whenever we pray, we should have confidence. Whenever we're doing the will of God, we should have confidence. Whenever we go forth in the strength of the Lord, by the calling of the Lord, we should have confidence. Whether we, whenever we're sharing the gospel with a neighbor, with another person, we should have confidence. And whenever we're at the center of the will of God in a life that is totally committed and yielded to God, we should should have confidence and we have confidence in the Lord touching you that he both will we ye both do and will do the things which we command you the things which we command that's what makes us godly when we abide in the will of God abide in the word of God we have confidence that you will do we have confidence that you will obey that we have confidence that you will carry out everything we learn because to see it is the word of God and you receive that word not as a word of man you receive it as it is in truth the word of the Lord coming to you directly Philippians chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 12 Philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 12 it says therefore my beloved as ye have always obeyed what a commendation what a commendation and evidence of true salvation as ye have always obeyed that's the evidence of their sanctification as ye have always obeyed whether Paul was there he was not there they had received the word and they knew it wasn't the word of Paul they knew it was the word of God only it came through the microphone of, of Paul he said wherefore my brethren my beloved as she have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling and then in verse 13 verse 13 he tells us that they have obeyed in his absence and they have obeyed also in his presence in verse 13 it now says for it is God which walketh in you I need to permit him, allow him. He gives us the free will. But as we give ourselves totally unto him without reservation, it is God which walketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And then in verse 14, he says uh, how we should do all things, the mind we should have in doing all things, and the attitude, the comportment we should have in doing in all things the faithfulness we should manifest in doing all things do, do all things without murmurings and disputing no debate no argument and there's no half-heartedness with all our heart with all our soul and with everything that was within us with all the grace we've got at salvation and the grace we've got at sanctification and the great grace we got after we are baptized in the holy ghost with all the grace we have we do all things not some things not the ones we like and then the ones we don't the ones we don't like then we do that half-heartedness but it says do all things without murmurings and disputings then in verse 15 in verse 15 it tells us uh, how we ought to behave how we ought to act it says that ye may be blameless and harmless I pray as sons of God you'll be harmless 
I pray as sons of God, you'll be blameless, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And then in verse 16, in verse 16, holding forth the watch of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. He said, I am holding forth the word of Christ, the word of the gospel, the word of salvation, but the book should not stop by me. I extend it to you and you too, as you have heard, as you have experienced, as you have been, as you are practicing, as you are carrying on the word of God, you too, you are holding forth that same word. I'm evangelizing, you are evangelizing. I'm persuading men you are persuading men. I am going out to the, uh, to the regions beyond and you are going out to the communities beyond that as I pull forth the word of life and the word of salvation that you too holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain. It tells us in uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 1. Here is what it tells us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from, uh, reading from verse verse 1. In verse 1 he tells us, it says and furthermore then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the word, by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as ye have received, as ye have received, don't change it, as ye have received, don't, don't mutilate or modify, as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and and to please God so ye would abound more and more as you have received the word and you have accepted the word and you have believed the word so you will live and you will abound more and more look at verse 2 there in verse 2 there he is still speaking to them those Thessalonians and is still exhorting them those Thessalonians who had received the word of grace that received the word of life they received the word of his power for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ we didn't just uh, churn out and give out and pour out unto you our opinions our ideas our ideologies our philosophy we gave unto you commandments by the word of the Lord and then he tells us let's look at a verse we're looking at verse uh, 7 there in verse 7 and uh, first Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 7 for God has not called us unto uncleanness but unto holiness he has called you unto holiness I said he called you unto holiness and that call you'll fulfill every moment every minute every time in your life in Jesus name and then in verse 9 look at verse 9 there it tells us in verse 9 concerning these Thessalonian believers but as touching brotherly love ye need not that I write unto you for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another if you're only taught of men you'll be doubting you'll be wondering and you'll not be steady but when you are taught of God and you know God himself revealed this to you taught you this and got you into the depths of the gospel and it teaches you the life of love the life of grace and the life of godliness and the life of being good to everybody around you you will do it more and more look at verse 10 it tells us in verse 10 and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren that is we carry out the word of God 
with conviction toward all the brethren and he says uh, which are in all Macedonia but will beseech you brethren that he increase more and more don't slow down more and more don't take one step forward and two steps backward more and more don't retard and don't retreat more and more don't uh, minimize the calling and the conviction the lord had given you more and more i pray the lord will increase godliness in every one of our lives in jesus name in 2 Peter chapter 3, we're reading from verse 11. 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 11. 2 Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, all the things of the world shall be dissolved, all the things that people amass in the world shall be dissolved, all the things that people build in the world shall be dissolved, all the ambitions of men in the world shall be dissolved, all the things that people are sacrificing their lives for, and they're not serving the Lord, it says seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of men, what manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness? That's the kind of life we ought to live, knowing that the elements of melt to a fervent heat, knowing that Christ, when he comes, the only thing that will matter is what you have, is what you do by his grace in the calling, in the ministry God has given you. He says, knowing that all this shall be resolved, we need to live in all holy conversation and godliness we're coming to number three here number three our prayers to god for everyone everywhere our prayers to god for everyone everywhere first timothy chapter two we're reading verse from verse one first timothy chapter two verse one i exhort therefore that first of all supplications prayers intercessions giving of thanks be made for all men those who are not saved will pray for them uh, that they may be saved all men those who are backsliding will pray for them uh, that they will be restored those who are standing standing saints will pray for them that they will endure to the very end and those who are ministering and serving, we pray for them that we're courage of character and we're backbone, firm, enduring to the end. We pray for them that they'll have grace more and more. It tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 11. It tells us here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God will count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, and the work of faith with power. What prayer? That's the prayer we're praying for brethren. That's the prayer we're praying for new babes in Christ. That's the prayer we're praying for all those who belong to the Lord. We pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling. The vocation he has called the believers to, the calling he has given the believers, and the people have just come into the kingdom, the calling he has given them. We pray that God will count them worthy of that calling and fulfill all his good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with 
power and then he tells us in verse 12 he says in verse 12 still praying for them and still holding them up before the Lord and still presenting them before the Lord and doing that always whatever is some personal challenge praying for the believers always that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you that in your character in your conduct in your lifestyle in your behavior at work at home that everything you do will make the name of the Lord Jesus will be glorified and in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 14, is praying for the believers and it shows us an example of how to pray for the believers. He's praying for the children of God and is giving us an example as how we ought to pray for the believers. It says, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ and then in verse 15 he tells us in verse 15 talking about the reason why he was on bended knees the reason why he was kneeling before the Lord and praying for the family of God here on earth and there in heaven of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named what are the uh, subjects and the items and the requests in the prayer it tells us in uh, verse 16 verse 16 tells us it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by spirit in the inner man he was praying that the believers of his day the believers in his ministry will not be weak on their knees will not be weak in their hearts will not be weak in their conviction will not be weak when they're going through challenges will not be weak in any situation they find themselves and the same thing for us with us as we're praying for believers believers in our ministry believers in our house fellowship believers in our local church and believers all in, in the whole church and the ones that you know we remember on our prayer list that he the Lord God Almighty would grant unto them according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the in a man and then in verse 20 it tells us in verse 20 it says in verse 20 here now unto him that is able our God is able able to save our God is able able to work wonders in every life our God is able able to sustain us and support us and succor us and his uh, grace will be sufficient in our lives our God is able able to solve your problem able to destroy the works of the devil able to fulfill all the good desires of your life able to make you strong and to make you firm and to make you continue without shaking until the end of your life in jesus name unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us according to the power that walketh in you. Look at verse 21. It says unto him, be glory. Unto him, the Lord who is able. Unto him, the Lord who works wonders in our lives. Unto him, the Lord who is able to preserve you from evil and to see you through and carry you through. Unto him, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. We're coming to point number three here. Point number three, our preparation or patience for his uh, glorious preeminence. Our preparation with patience, with perseverance, with endurance for his glorious preeminence. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 
3 verse 5 it says and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ the Lord will direct you establish you and confirm your steps until the Lord comes that we are waiting for in Jesus name Second Thessalonians chapter 1 reading from verse 10 in Second Thessalonians chapter 1 reading from verse 10 when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day and then in verse 11 verse 11 wherefore also we pray always for you we pray always for you you as a leader can you say that to all your, all your uh, members of the house fellowship we pray always for you can you tell people in your local church faithfully we pray always for you as a leader the people you are leading the people you are discipling the people you are bringing to the lord all the time or you only presenting the word of god unto them he wants you to present them before the lord wherefore also we pray always for you that our god will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. I pray all our converts will grow up steadily and grow up firmly and God will preserve them in his perfect will in Jesus' name. Three things we're looking at. Number one, possessing the love of God while waiting for Christ. We're waiting for the coming of Christ. We're waiting for the glorious appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And while we're waiting, we possess the love of God. Number two, preserving the life of godliness, watching for Christ. We say, he may come today, he may come tomorrow, he may come tonight, and because of that, we're watching and we're watching in godliness we don't want him to come and find us not prepared not ready we don't want him to come and meet us in any form of unrighteousness or ungodliness therefore we preserve the life of godliness watching for christ number three preaching and living by grace as witnesses for Christ. Look at number one. Number one, possessing the love of God while waiting for Christ. It tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, the Lord direct your hearts, direct your mind, direct your thoughts, direct your inner man. The Lord directs your ways. The Lord directs your heart and the Lord directs your inner man to the, into the love of God and into patient waiting for Christ. You are conscious of the Lord's return every time. Because of that, you don't have anything in you that's opposite or contrary to the love of God. He preserves you in the love of God, loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind as you're expecting that the Lord will come any time. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 3. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and then it tells us in verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. He remembered 
their work of faith remembered, they are harvesting in faith, they remembered their ministry based on faith, and they remembered their labor of love. Their labor of love. We labor with excitement, we labor with joy, we labor with happiness, we labor, we love the people we're laboring with and we're laboring on. We're not, uh, you know, bearing grudge and saying, why do I have to do this? If you are murmuring and complaining, you cannot labor in love. But when you are excited, what a great privilege that I can preach, what a great privilege I can evangelize, what a great privilege I can bring the word of life unto the people that need to come to life. What a great privilege. I can, I can lift up Christ. He says, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men unto, my, unto myself. What a great privilege. He has baptized all the people and he has chosen me to do that. When you are excited like that and you do what you do with joy, then it is labor of love. And while you're doing that, you're waiting for the coming of the Lord. It tells us in verse 10 of that first chapter, the first Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven. He came the first time, is coming again. It is his first coming that has brought salvation to you, has brought redemption to you, has brought a new life unto you, has brought eternal life unto you. And you say, if the first coming can bring such a life, what will the second coming bring? And because of that, you wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. He'll deliver you completely in Jesus' name. Look at First John chapter 2, reading from verse 5. In First John chapter 2, we're reading from verse 5. Here it tells us, but who so keepeth his word in him, Verily, in him verily is the love of God perfected. That's how we know whether we have the love of God or not. When we cherish his word, when we love his word, when we're excited about his word, when we eagerly, without delay, obey the word of God, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him and then he tells us in verse 6 in verse 6 it says he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk so to walk even as he walked I pray that this love of God will abide and remain and increase in every one of our hearts in Jesus name Jude chapter 1 verse 20 Jude chapter 1 reading from verse 20 in Jude chapter 1 verse 20 here is Jude the servant of the Lord speaking to every one every individual in the church of the living God he says but you beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith your praying in the Holy Ghost. You are praying in the Holy Ghost. If you are praying for the apostles, praying in the Holy Ghost. If you are praying for the ministers, praying in the Holy Ghost. If you are praying for the brethren, praying in the Holy Ghost. If you are praying for the church, praying in the Holy Ghost. And then it says in verse 21, it says, you are keeping yourselves, keep yourselves in the love of God. God. While you are praying, you cannot be praying with murmuring, with hatred, with animosity, with grumbling in the heart. If it's going to be answered, God is love and is a God of love and you pray from a loving heart. You pray for those people you are praying for because of the love of God in your heart towards them and towards God. Because of that, you keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of 
of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We're looking at number two here. Number two, we're looking at uh, preserving uh, the life of godliness, watching, uh, preserving the life of godliness, we're watching uh, for Christ. He's coming, and when he comes, he'll find you watching. He'll find me watching. You'll be watching in Jesus' name. And all these years of labor, all this period of labor, will not be lost when Christ comes. He'll meet you watching. He'll find you praying. He'll find you persevering. He'll find you enduring to the very end in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 36. Watch it therefore and pray always. Watch it therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. is coming in the rapture and is coming with the saints. After that rapture will be the great tribulation. And when he comes, those who go with the Lord will escape the great tribulation. That's why he says, you watch it therefore, and you pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. First Peter chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 7. It says, But the end of all things is at hand. The end of all the persecution, all the affliction, all the suffering, all the misunderstanding, and the end of all that we go through in the world, the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The end it's around the corner, it's at the door. Because of that, watch unto prayer. In Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at verse 2. Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Look at your life. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain as we get nearer and nearer the coming of the Lord that's not the time to be weak that's not the time to be unstable that's not the time to be wavering that's not the time to be powerless that's not the time to be purposeless it says be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it tells us, as he now reminds us to watch, he wants us to remember what we need to strengthen, what we need to put in place, and what we need to be firm about. He says, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent if therefore thou shalt not watch i will come unto thee as a thief that may suddenly unannounced and thou shalt not know what hour i will come upon thee then in verse 4 it tells all there are those who are watching it tells all there are those who are worthy there are those who have kept their garments clean and white there are those who have kept their experiences in the Lord on stage and so he says that was a few names even in studies which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me a white for they are worthy I'll be of that number I said I'll be of that number the number of those who are watching 
the number of those who are worthy, the number of those who are waiting, the number of those who are ready at, his, at the time of his coming. I pray you'll be among the number in Jesus' name. And then he says in verse 5, he tells us in verse 5 what will happen. He tells us in verse 5, the privilege they will have, the glory that will come upon them. He says, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. I will not blot out his name. He's enduring, I will not blot out his name. He's persevering, I will not blot out his name. He's uh, steady in the Lord. I I will not blot out his name he is established in the faith once delivered unto the saints I will not blot out his name he says I will not blot out his name before my father I will confess him and before his angels we're looking at Revelation chapter 16 verse 15 Revelation chapter 16 Reading from verse 15, Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief, suddenly unannounced. Blessed is he that watcheth. He wants us to be watching until he comes. Blessed is, is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked. And you see a shame. You'll keep your garments in Jesus' name. Point number three there. Number three, preaching and living by grace as witnesses for Christ. It's giving us the work to do. And it says we should occupy until he comes. It's giving us the work to do, and we are his witnesses. It's giving us the work to do, and he has said, as the Father has sent him, so as he sent us, like he was faithful, and he lived to show us the extent and the depth and all the implications of the grace of God in our lives, I pray we'll so link ourselves with him, connect ourselves with him, we'll live in his grace, by his grace, for his glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go, go ye into all the world. Go ye into all the world. You start with your own community, all your world. You start with your own contacts, all your world. And then you tell them, those contacts, what I'm sending to you, what I'm preaching to you, what I'm proclaiming to you, proclaim to other people on your contacts, and those people too, they will proclaim to people in their contacts. We call that exponential proclamation. I tell many people, each of those many people tell all the many people in their contacts, each of those they tell all the contacts they have and then we have exponential spread of the gospel go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature then in verse 16 it tells us he that believeth verse 16 he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned look at verse 20 he told them to go and they went he's telling us to go and we're going to go and you will go and i will keep going and as I go, and you go, and we all go, and the people will reach, they also go. The power of the Lord will go with everyone and walk with everyone in Jesus' name. Our world will hear the gospel. Our generation will hear the gospel. They will believe many will be saved in Jesus' name. And they went forth. 
and they went forth and they went forth and they preached tell me and they preached tell me out aloud if you are happy with them for what they did tell me tell me if you are going to do like they did and you are going to follow in their steps tell me the Lord will give you the grace and the strength and the power the enablement and the, and the fruit your work, your ministry will bear fruit in Jesus name and they went forth they didn't stay in they didn't lock themselves in it is raining we cannot go out uh -uh. the hawkers and the people who are selling their merchandise is raining they go out your co-workers they go to their office the marketers they go to their markets when it's raining raining rain will not stop you they're making noise there they're shouting over there i cannot go out and they are shouting and doing all those over there those who want to go and visit their friends and those who are going to their salesmen they are selling this and this they are going out if they can go out you will go out they went forth and they preach everywhere the lord walking with them if we don't go out, he cannot walk with us. The power is there. The anointing is there. The unction is there. And the glory is there. And the presence of the Lord and partnership of the Lord, everything is there. But if you don't go out, he cannot go with you. They went forth. They preached everywhere. And the Lord walking with them and confirming the word or signs following in your life was signs following in your ministry was signs following this coming week and the week is starting tomorrow signs will follow your ministry and then during the global crusade coming ahead of us as we gather the people together at the alpha location signs following in your own location signs following in every country of the world, signs following. And the signs that follow will flow into your life as well. What is the person I'm talking about tonight? Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Why don't you stand up? Why don't you stand up and commit yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, everything I've learned tonight, I'm going to go forth. Everything I've had tonight, I'm going to go forth and the signs will follow in your life in Jesus' name. Open your mouth, open your mouth. They went forth, they went forth, they went forth. We're going forth, we're going forth, and they preach everywhere. And you're going to preach everywhere, and the Lord will confirm the word of your mouth.